Excellent. I think we're live now. Hello, everyone. Greetings from the UK. My name is Dagina Weatherill, and I'm the Director of Recruitment at Global University Systems UK Division, uh, overseeing international students' recruitment for a number of UK universities. And today, I'm extremely excited to talk about one of our premium partner universities, University for the Creative Arts in the UK. And I'm joined here by Paul Found. Hi, Paul. Um, Good morning. Hi, morning. Who is a senior lecturer for industrial design and design media architecture at University for the Creative Arts. So we'll be talking about uh, one of the exciting subjects, uh, architecture and interior design at UCA today. Thank you all for joining. Um, just a few housekeeping rules. You're all on mute. If you'd like to ask any questions, feel free to do so. Just pop them into the Q&A section and we'll take them from there later. Other than that, sit back, enjoy the webinar, and I hope you find it useful. Um, you will also receive a recording after the webinar. If you do have any further questions after the webinar, feel free to reach out to your educational advisor or your agency uh, or business developer. If you haven't started working with GAS yet to recruit students for UCA, um, then feel free to reach out to UCA partners at gas.global and we will review your um, educational agency application from there. Um, and yeah, enjoy the webinar. Over to you, Paul, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. All right, just share my screen. Good morning. Okay, is that coming through okay? I hope so. Yes, we can see it. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah, just to repeat, I'm here to speak about the University for the Creative Arts. So if you're expecting something else, maybe you're in the wrong place. Stick around anyway, because this might be interesting for you. Um, so, yeah, uh, welcome. Um, as Dejina said, I'm Paul Found. I'm lecturer in industrial design and design media at Canterbury School of Architecture. Uh, what it's, um, yeah, I mean, where, where industrial design fits into the school will become clear as we progress, um, but I will mainly be talking about architecture and interior architecture and design at UCA. Um, it's all part of the same school as will become clear. Um, Although the focus will be on Canterbury School of Architecture, I'm also contractually obliged to mention that UCA is ranked as the number one specialist creative university for 2021 by both the Guardian Best Universities League Tables and the Complete University Guide. Um, yeah, we're very proud of our standing of our rankings um, and we are committed to giving students the best experience possible. You know, the reason why we are high in these rankings is that we, you know, we work hard to be good at what we do and to ensure students are you know, enjoying their time at UCA, but also, you know, gaining a qualification, gaining professional skills, gaining professional experience, um, you know, on which they can, you know, build successful careers. You know, we think we do this very well. And I think the league tables do show this. So, um, yeah, so as I said, you know, we are the number one specialist art and design university in the UK. Um, you know, the School of Architecture, particularly, you know, we have a, you know, our, our campus means students are surrounded by, you know, spatial designers and makers and thinkers, you know, we also have artists and graphic designers all on one campus, you know, we see ourselves as a creative community, essentially, um, you know, we think this, you know, it creates a nice atmosphere for learning, it fosters creativity, certainly, um, and again, it's a big part of, of, you know, how we achieve success. You know, we are a creative university. Everybody here is creative in some way. Um, but also, you know, we do focus on employability. You know, we do live projects, placements, mentoring. You know, a lot of the courses, certainly in architecture, you know, has a professional, professional practice element to it. You know, again, these are very valuable for students who come to study here. You know, it prepares you for the world of work. Um, alongside, you know, we have dedicated studios and excellent workshop facilities. You know, I will talk a little bit about these later. You know, but we are we are studio 
focused. You know, that's how our students learn. That's how we teach um, generally. It's been a bit different in the last year, um, you know, but we are going back to, to studio-based learning. Um, Link to that, you know, teaching and learning, you know, it's very hands-on as well, you know, in the sense of briefs are project-based and with real-world applications, you know, as you'll see a bit later, you know, a lot of the projects that students do are kind of, they're locally focused, not all of them, but, you know, our students go out, they survey sites, you know, they are dealing with kind of local architecture, interior design problems, and coming up with solutions, you know, that could be enacted in the real world. Again, this is very important. Um, and also the teaching staff, you know, the academics, we're all um, leading practitioners. You know, we are all designers, makers, architects, um, creative people. You know, we, we, that is our first, that's kind of our first profession, if you like, aside from being teachers. You know, so we are learning from people who are good at what they do, know what they're talking about, know how industry works. Um, yeah, so the focus of today's webinar is UCA's Canterbury School of Architecture. Um, the school has two distinct but closely aligned programs of courses. So there is the architecture program and the design program. Um, so throughout this presentation, pink will signify architecture, blue will signify design. Um, the reasons why this distinction is highlighted will kind of become clear when I'm talking about which courses are in which school because it's it's not overly complicated um, but it just makes it easier if, it, if things have a nice nice color coding system. Um, so as you'd expect the architecture program consists of our fully validated and accredited uh, ARB and RIBA architecture pathway which gives the opportunity to go from BA in architecture, which is the part one, REBA, um, and MArch, Master of Architecture, all the way through to a postgraduate certificate uh, professional practice in architecture, which is part three of the REBA qualification. Um, those of you who don't know, ARB is the Architects Registration Board, and REBA is the Royal Institute of British Architects. Um, so our courses are, like I say, they're fully validated and accredited you know, students who complete our course, you know, they become fully qualified, registered, validated, accredited architects. Um, the design course consists of BA Honours Interior Architecture and Design, which is mainly what I'll talk about today. But also there are two master's degree courses. So there is a MA in architecture, which is not accredited. I will explain a little bit more about this later and an MA in interior design. Um, alongside those, it's kind of more my area. There are also BSCs in creative computing and industrial design, um, which I mention, even though they're not really the focus of today's web webinar. You know, so we do have these like two, they're slightly smaller, but growing courses attached to the design, design pathway. Mm -mm -mm. So as I said, the two programs are closely aligned. So our first year architecture and interior students, um, which we call stage one, are taught together in a dedicated studio space and they share the same briefs and the course structure. Um, the reason for this is that the, lots of the fundamental skills, techniques, processes, and ideas, you know, they're common to both disciplines. Um, so these are introduced and developed during stage one. So this is things like site surveying, you know, dimensioning buildings, drawing, visual communications. You know, it's the it's the foundation, you know, on which further study um, is based. You know, it's the foundation on which these professions are based. You know, these these kind of these core skills, if you like. Um, so as I said, the School of Architecture has a very strong studio culture. You know, I think this is what sets us apart from many other courses. You know, this is a photo of our year one, stage one studio. Um, I mean, the, the previous photo and the photo on the left has kind of been what it's been like for a lot of this year in the UK because of lockdown, but the photos on the right give an impression of what it is usually like. It is very busy. Students kind of have 
their own space to work. You know, they are working with, you know, similar people. You know, we have year cohorts of 80 to 100 students rather than 250, which means students are guaranteed to receive, you know, one-to-one -one contact time with their students, uh, sorry, with their tutors, uh, you know, at least once a week. You know, this is fundamental to what we do. You know, students are, they are guided, you know, closely. They are advised, they are given continuous feedback in what they are doing. Um, you know, again, this is, this is very important, particularly in first year. You know, joining a BA course, you know, it's a big change. You know, you want to feel supported. You want to know that you are kind of doing the right kinds of things. Um, but also this idea of being in the studio, sharing a studio space. You know, these are lively creative spaces. You know, uh, you know we encourage ideas to be exchanged and collaborations to develop. Um, you know, this, is, this all helps in the creative process. You know, there's no doubt about this. Um, we also actively encourage students to engage with the city of Canterbury when we are based and the surrounding area. Um, I don't have it, any examples here, but previously students have done projects based around Canterbury's famous cathedral, you know, where they, they go down, they survey the site, they take photos, they do sketches, they do measurements, and the whole project is based on installations within the cathedral. You know, we, we like our students to engage with the place where they are living. Um, the examples here are another brief where students in small groups create what are what we call drawing machines. You know, so they build and design analog or physical devices that they use to capture some of the, you know, the essence, the feel for a particular site. You know, so this is a, an old, it's an old gunpowder works not far from Canterbury. Um, it's kind of like a, it's a place where people go walking now, but a lot of the buildings are still there. So the task was that students would kind of draw it in, a, in an unconventional way to get more of a feel for the site. Um, so this example uses a roll of paper and an ink roller to capture textures from the walls and from the floor and from the pathways, for example. Um, and this one, uh, again, at the same site, this one allows sheets of paper to be lowered into the water. Um, so it's like a physical, provides a physical connection between the site and the paper and the person. Um, you know, again, this is it's about kind of pushing people's creativity, pushing people's idea of what, you know, architecture, interior architecture design can be. Um, so, as I said, you know, so the first year architecture and interior design kind of get taught together. In the second year, they kind of split. They kind of follow their own pathway. Um, so after year one, the architecture program and the design program diverge um, and students move on to kind of a subject specific pathway. Um, I mean, there are points throughout the year where the courses do meet again. You know, doing things like learning CAD skills, for example. You know, students might be working in the same, might be in the same classes in the same sessions. You know, we do have briefs that cover both courses. Um, so, you know, so the courses, they separate and then briefly come back together and then separate again. But certainly by year, after year, after the first year, it becomes more specialist, shall we say. Um, so the pathway that UC offers is all the way from BA Honours, so REBA Part 1, through to the Master of Architecture, which is Part 2, and all the way through to Part 3. Um, I mentioned this just so you know, people in the audience out there are aware that this is a possibility. You know, obviously, I'm focusing only on the undergraduate course in this presentation. Um, but yeah, it is good to be aware that this possibility exists to become fully qualified um, through UCA. Um, so first year architecture is, as we've seen, taught alongside architecture and interior architecture and design students. Um, and aside from the less typical project like drawing machines, that may seem like a strange thing to, to start with. Um, but I think it's, it's in there just to demonstrate how we do things, you know, we do things a little differently from other universities. 
you know we kind of ensure we focus on kind of creative thinking you know kind of problem solving look at the world in a slightly different way um which is which is useful um but we do of course do more if you like traditional kind of architecture briefs if you like you know the kind of thing you would you would commonly expect to see you know this is the fundamental part of architecture is you are designing architecture um so just some examples of stage one work so first year work um so this is an example of a site study for example you know you can it's kind of um kind of like the drawing machines idea it's about getting a communicating a feel for a place a mood of a place as well as its location and what happens in there um excuse me um then obviously this moves through to kind of you know drawing proposals for buildings as I expect um this is another one based i think in margate which is a seaside town near us you know there is the development happening all the time but this will have been for a project in a local area to design i think this may have been a like a museum gallery community space for this project i'm not entirely sure but this is the kind of thing our stage one students work on and then one final example uh, this one and this one um so this this is the quality of the work that our students are capable of, of producing you know I, I would like to say it's because of the teaching and the facilities but of course most of it is because the students themselves you know we attract high caliber students you know because they can they i would say they buy into how uca does things you know the students you know they thrive with us you know they they work hard they take in all this learning they kind of buy into this this way of doing things and you know because students are a high caliber it pushes it pushes them to do their best work it pushes them to do better um so that's kind of that's the stage one um stage two work in architecture so year two um some of the work becomes kind of a bit more conceptual so this was a we we'll call it a boat but it's kind of like a, a water observation kind of design invention piece of architecture machine if you like um so yeah it becomes kind of more more blue sky more conceptual thinking um and then this is just another example of architecture stage two work so again you know this the quality high quality work is what our students produce um at stage three you know so this is final year of the ba honors in architecture uh, so arb rebus stage one um so before stage three you know the work is creative you know it's exciting but this stage is you know is rooted in real world sites and design problems as well you know there is a place for not so much the mundane you know but the practical practical solutions to design problems you know there is also a place for very conceptual architecture very conceptual thinking you know conceptual ideas um by the time our students reach the third year you know they are combining they are combining these two things you know they are judging where something needs to be practical functional real world but also where you know the speculative can come into their design work as well uh, another example of final output so again you know i emphasize you know the high quality of the work you know as a piece of visual communication but also as a piece of design as a piece of presentation there's two more examples uh yeah so on completion of the ba honors you know there is an opportunity to study for a master of architecture the m arch which is the arb reba part two uh which is you know could also study uca and then finally the pg 
postgraduate certificate, I should say, of professional practice in architecture, um, which is part three of REBA, you know, so that you can progress from undergraduate to fully qualified architect all at UCA. You know, we do, we do help with mentoring and, you know, support placements for students, certainly on the part three. You know, so, you know, the, there is an entire system in place for supporting students through this uh, entire journey. Uh, moving on to the design program. So, as I said, the design program is where our interior architecture and design undergraduate course sits, um, along with creative computing and industrial design. Um, again, there is some contact creative computing and industrial design are quite closely linked but then you know we do encourage our students to kind of not not cross over into courses but you know be, be aware of what you know the interior architecture design students are doing you know so industrial and creative computing and interior architecture and design students do a group project in the second year where they, we kind of mix them up mix them together so they kind of become aware of each other's processes, practices, techniques. You know, it's all to do with fostering new ways of thinking. You know, creative computing students think very differently from interior architecture and design students, for example. You know, but they can be influenced by and take ideas from each other. You know, this helps helps spark you know fresh ideas, new ideas. Um, and yeah, and then after this, the Design program also has an MA in interior design and an MA in architecture. I'll talk a little bit more about how the MA in architecture differs from the M Arch Masters of Architecture a little later. Um, so BA honors interior architecture and design. Um, so, like I've already said, you know, this is taught alongside architecture students in the first year. Um, so you've kind of seen some of the examples of, of work that comes from that. So I should move on to kind of second year work. Um, yeah, like I said, lots of the work is based kind of in the on sites in the local area, so Canterbury or, or Kent. Um, a lot of the briefs in the past have focused on a town called Margate, which is on the Kent coastline. So it's a kind of a seaside town. Um, it's what you'd call kind of a developing town. It's kind of becoming fashionable, but there are still, you know, issues with economic deprivation, for example, like there are in lots of UK seaside towns, uh, coastal communities. Um, so this is, so one of the second year projects was about this. Um, this one was based on a kind of like a vintage theme park. It was opened in the 1920s called Dreamland. And this was to do with creating some kind of building a solution that in, encouraged community engagement amongst, you know, firstly older people in the community, but also, you know, subsequent generations about sharing um, memories. So this one particularly is about, you know, the the older people engaging with younger generations and children talking about their memories of Margate, their life there, what it used to be like. Um, the idea being that then kind of the community can, you know, think of ideas to, you know, improve, improve the area, basically. Um, so that was the idea behind that project. Um, this one was a proposal for a cafe designed to build the foundations for a more positive and connective environment. Um, so for example, it uses circular seating um, to encourage users to engage in conversation and then kind of to collaborate and kind of and help form this sense of community. You know, it's a space where people are supposed to go and at the most basic level, you know, make new friends, get in touch with people they haven't met before. You know, talk, talk about what it's like to live in Margate, you know, talk about hopes for the town in the future, for example. And finally, this one is a proposal for an edu educational space. Um, so where both visitors, you know, Margate is a touristy, 
you know, it's a tourist town. You know, there are lots of visitors go there as well. Um, but it's where visitors and locals can learn about the environment and also particularly about the potential of seaweed to become a variety of types of sustainable materials. You know, so this is thinking more broadly belong beyond the building itself, but also issues again of community, but also sustainability and the use of an abundant local material, sea, you know, seaweed to make new materials and local products, you know, and then stimulate, you know, businesses, you know, it is all about stimulating local business, you know, attracting creative people to go there, for example. Um, so yes, that's kind of an example of kind of year two interiors. Um, another examples of the space, interior architecture and design in general. And on the left-hand side is kind of a photograph of what the studios look like when the students are in and working. You know, there is a, there is a strong emphasis on making, you know, making models, experimenting with materials, this kind of thing. You know, we, we intentionally have lots of shelf space, storage space in the studios because students, they are in all the time, they are making. They are testing designs, you know, redesigning something if it doesn't work, you know. Um, and on the right-hand side is a it's kind of a, a slightly abstract photo, but it's, it's demonstrating the sense of, you know, our view of interior architecture and design, although, yes, it is about interior building space, but it's also about space in general and how we interact with it. You know, this is not a traditional building but it is a space that somebody is interacting with so it is about materials and touch you know the things that you learn from you know small scale experiments if you like you know they can be applied at the larger scale um it's this you know it's this thinking thinking in a slight non-traditional way about the about the discipline um this is a photo of some of our students surveying a site and a building in Margate. You know, like I said, our projects, they are often based um, locally. So students can actually go and survey the site and they can learn about its surroundings. You know, they learn about the community that their proposal will, if you like, be sitting in. You know, interior design architecture, you know, cannot be designed in isolation with no regard for what exists, you know, what surrounds it. Um, so yeah, so our, our students, you know, they, they go out on site, you know, they, they learn to survey, they take surveys, you know, this is what they base their work on. Um, this is a couple of examples of final year work. Again, um, I think these demonstrate, you know, how, how closely linked, you know, these ideas of the architecture side and our interior architecture and design are, you know, it's about, it's not just about making an interior space, you know, look nice. You know, people think interior design, you know, they maybe think, you know, color and materials. Yes, it is certainly about that, but it is also about, you know, how people use the space as well. You know, the context for the space. Um, and these are just, these are a couple of examples that I think demonstrate that. Uh, so again, while you know I am highlighting undergraduate opportunities, you know there are also pathways for master's degree study in either MA Interior Design or MA Architecture. Again, both of these focus on the design or redesign or reuse of spaces. Um, so the architecture one, say it's it's not the accredited master of architecture. It is a master of arts in architecture. So slightly different. Um, so, you know, it can involve, it can be physical spaces. Certainly it can be physical spaces, but it can also be virtual environments. You know, so a lot of our students work with, you know, mixed media, virtual reality, um, augmented reality as well. It's starting to be used quite a lot now. You know, this idea that it needs to be a physical space that you are designing for. Um, isn't something that we necessarily agree with, you know. You know v VR, AR, virtual reality, augmented reality, you know, they are becoming more of a part of our lives. They will increasingly do so in future. 
you know, so we do encourage students to, to think of space in the virtual sense as well, you know, the digital space. Um, so it can also be interactive spaces, you know, perhaps closer to artworks, I suppose you would say, you know, like sen this is a sensory, sp sensory space, you know, so sensors kind of move parts of the installation as well, you know, talk about human, human and space interaction as well. This is, you know, again, this is an important part of what we do here. You know, it's why, why we have a creative computing course is because we have, we in the past have had architecture students, interior design students who are interested in learning about computer code and sensors and robots and artificial intelligence and virtual reality. You know, the creative computing course kind of grew out of that. Um, you know, so we do have, you know, we do have academics, we do have resources for this kind of project as well. Uh, moving on, tools of the trade, you know, I've already mentioned the dedicated studio spaces, you know, and how we, how our students kind of thrive in that atmosphere, that creative atmosphere. Um, the UCA also offers a great range of facilities and resources as well. You know, I did mention that you know we put a lot of emphasis on making physical objects as part of the design process. Um, you know, and yes, as well, we encourage people to to draw and sketch and plan, and to be able to create you know three D CAD models of you know their proposals, their ideas. You know, but we do emphasise this kind of this physicality, this materiality of things. You know, go into the workshop make something, hold it in your hand, know how the material behaves, know how the material works. Um, so you know, we have a wood workshop for hand making. You know, we do have you know, expert technician support always on hand as well. You know, the technicians are, you know, they are makers as well. You know, they do, they make furniture, they make detailed models of, you know, like sci-fi figures, one of the guys, you know, they are constantly making as well. Um, um, so we have, you know, the traditional material machines you would expect, you know, pillar drills, table saws, lathes, you know, this kind of traditional material. But we do also have, you know, tools, more digital tools such as milling machine, um, CNC router as well, CNC router, depending on how you prefer to say it, CNC routers. Um, again, so students can make large scale work as well. You know, again, these are, these are available for students to use. Uh, in addition, we also have uh, a fab lab, which has a range of both filament and resin 3D printers. And we also have a suite of laser cutters as well that the students uh, can use. Um, all of these machines are free to use. For example, we don't charge for 3D printing. You know, students buy their own materials, but there is no charge for laser cutter time, for example. You know, our students are inducted to learn all these machines safely. You know, they learn health and safety. And although there is technical support available, you know, a lot of the time students are encouraged, you know, they're expected to know how these process, processes work you know, set up their own files for laser cutting, you know, uh, make the laser machine do the cutting, understand why something might have gone wrong, for example. You know, these are all transferable professional skills that are useful um, as they progress, you know, through their career. Um, we also have on site um, virtual reality and 3D scanning facilities, uh, alongside, of course, PCs in the studios we have a dedicated pc lab which is mainly used for um teaching software you know but students can access it as well when it's not in use you know we have a range of industry standard software that students can access so for architects you know things like autocad you know the adobe suite but also rhino as well for 3d design um fusion 360 as well you know, all of these things are available for our, for our students. You know, they they learn things, learn the software that is used in industry. Um, and yeah, finally, I would like to 
briefly mention the other two courses on the design program pathway, uh, mainly because it's my area, but also because it's just worth knowing what else is what else we offer. Um, so the BSc in Creative Computing is, excuse me, it kind of combines looking at, combines coding, um, but also physical making. So it's to do with creating games, you know, interactive installations. You know, the picture on the right was an installation that was placed in a, one of the trees on our campus. Um, so it kind of just, it hung down like this, but as you approached it, sensors would detect that somebody was there. So it would kind of curl up, almost hide in the tree. Um, so that's kind of some of the things that our students have done before. Um, creative computing also, you know, in, to do with the production of artworks, you know, data visualizations, um, and also physical computing devices. Um, example on the left is something that our first years are currently doing where they are creating a, what you call a kind of a controllable sound device. So they will find like an old guitar amplifier or a children's toy and they will learn how it works and they will kind of, if you like, hack, hack it so they can make it create new sounds and they kind of repackage it into these kind of like performance instruments, you know? So there is this hands-on electronics learning as well alongside the coding. Um, and my course, the industrial design, um, two pathways. So a three-year BSc and a four-year BSc with professional practice year, depending on which flavor the students prefer. Um, and again, this course has a lot of focus on the making of physical objects that are experimenting with materials uh, and processes. Um, we have a session lecturer who is a materials designer um, and students do a brief for her. So they talk about recycling materials or growing their own materials or using waste. I think one top right was pomegranate skins that they process to turn into different materials. Um, but then of course, you know, it is about developing design solutions through traditional skills. So, you know, sketching, drawing, you know, 3D CAD modeling, um, prototyping, you know, learning about industrial manufacturing processes, you know, all this, all these, all this does happen as well. But we like to think we do things a little differently by having this, you know, materials experimentation and process experimentation happening as well. Um, so yeah, where next for our graduates kind of starting to wind up the presentation? I mean, UCA graduates have gone on to work at uh, architecture at Grimshaw, Fosters and Partners, Zaha Hadid Architects, uh, amongst others. And we've had students go to work for the BBC, you know, Pinewood Film Studios as well. Um, other internationally renowned companies, of course, we've had students set up practices on their own. We've had students go to local practices that maybe people don't know, but they've gone on to be very successful, very valued employees, you know, members of the team as well. Um, and kind of this slide is kind of an overview of how we see our graduates developing you know we aim to develop graduates who not only work in their own chosen discipline but also across disciplines you know our courses they kind of they are designed to remove the often narrow idea of what architecture and interior design can be you know we'd like to think we produce you know the architect plus plus the interior designer plus plus you know so, so students can of course you know qualify as an architect be a successful architect but they can also move into things like perhaps exhibition design or cybernetics or museum design. You now, interior designers, you know, could go into experience design, research, lighting design, all of these things. You know, we'd like to make sure that students, you know, have a have like a wide a wide view of where they could go in the future. Um, and. Yeah, that is the end of my presentation. So thank you for listening. Um, as I said at the beginning, you know, there is time for questions, which we can answer at the end. You know, if there are any questions that I don't immediately know the answer to, you know, feel free to send me an email and I will respond as quickly as I can. Um, but yeah, I hope that was interesting, uh, inspiring, hopefully, um, useful. 
um, but yeah, that's the end from me. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Paul. It was definitely useful and really, really interesting. And I'm sure some of our uh, students who are coming to UCA have been inspired as well. Um, it's always great to see uh, what graduates do, I guess, during their studies and after graduation. Um, I think one of the questions that uh, is often being asked is about portfolio. Do you have any tips on portfolio students need to submit uh, for both undergraduate and postgraduate degrees at UCA? I mean, been very general, very short. Um, yeah, I mean, clearly always put in, you know, your best work, put your best projects first and last, because, you know, the first one is the one that you see and you think, wow, what a great student. And the last one gives you something to remember. Um, but in general, show the full range of what you can do. Clearly, if you're applying for architecture, yes, we want to know that you have knowledge of architecture, you have done, something around architecture but we, if you can paint really well we want to see that you can paint you know if you have experience of 3d printing things you know you will be that's a skill you will need to know include that as well you know um you know a lot of the work is to do with research you know if you have a good piece of research you know you found something interesting you've presented it in a way include that in your portfolio as well you know we want creative people but it's not only about 20 pages of really nicely drawn buildings. It's about all the things that you can do. That's kind of the short one. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and students applying for postgraduate degrees um, in architecture, do they need to have a relevant background? Um, so there is a question here, if somebody studied a um, subject like microbiology, for example, um, in India, and I would like to come and study at UCA, would they be able to apply directly or do they need to go through any other programs like graduate diploma perhaps, or do they need to start from the beginning from undergraduate level? If It would depend if they mean the ARB REBA architecture, because then you have to do each stage. You can't start at the uh, MArch level. But if we had somebody who I'd done an MA in, was it microbiology? I think I read the question. Yes. Yeah. If, again, it, it's portfolio. There is no reason why somebody coming from another discipline cannot come and do a creative course. It's about demonstrating, you know, an, an ability to be creative and do research and have, you know, interesting, interesting ideas. I mean, it's not a no, it depends on the individual application. You know, I mean, I'm fully aware there are lots of microbiologists, scientists who also create art, you know, kind of alongside their practice because they're studying cells. So they will create artwork based on what they're doing. Um, so it's, it's certainly possible, just not on the architecture, the Reba architecture, because that is a, it's like a stage process. You know, there are exams, you have to pass the exams at BA to do the MArch, and then you have to pass the exams for that to do the postgraduate certificate. Um, yeah, absolutely. And if students studied anything um, similar back home, would they be able to apply for any exemptions uh, for REBA qualification to be able to sort of proceed further or they do have to start from the beginning? Um, the architecture specific with, because the REBA is very specific and we are tied to the regulations, that is a question I would have to ask. So if you can forward it to me, I can find out to make sure I'm not telling you something that isn't true. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. No, that's that's very clear. And um, there is a question from Isha, just um, in terms of elaborating a little bit more about uh, ARB, you mentioned, and REBA part one and part two, please. Um, yeah, ARB, and I have to remember this, one is, excuse me, I need to check. <laughs> uh, REBA is the Royal Institute for British Architects, and ARB is, I can't remember the exact... Sorry, forgive me. I need to get on. Make sure, right. I, make sure I get this the, the name exactly right. Is it this association? I think it's the Association of Registered Architects. Something like that. Anyway, the po the point of it is in the UK, I guess other countries because you know most basically because buildings have to stand up. <laughs> you know there. Are, regulations that each each stage there are certain criteria that students have to demonstrate 
to a ARB, RIBA examiner. So they have to show they have a certain level of knowledge to progress to the next one. So kind of the BA is level one, the MArch is level two, and um, is sorry, part two, and then part three is the postgraduate certificate of professional practice, uh, which does involve, I think it's 24 months, demonstrating 24 months of working in architecture. And it essentially just means you are a registered architect. You can call yourself an accredited registered architect. Um, so it's kind of the UK system. I so say it probably differs from elsewhere a little bit, but it's just about ensuring, yeah, people are designing buildings that will stand up, that meet safety regulations, that meet construction regulations and all those. Kind yeah, of absolutely. I think there are um, lots of different, I guess, qualifications uh, in the UK for you to sort of progress in your career. You have to have a certain sort of professional level qualification or exemptions if you studied a relevant degree. Um, like I know in accounting, for example, it's ACCA, and there are mm -hmm. lots of abbreviations, CUA, et cetera. So I guess it's a similar thing uh, in architecture. Um, so are you saying that um, unless um, candidates have these qualifications, they wouldn't be able to apply for um, architecture specific um, jobs in the UK? I believe that's the case. Again, it's a question of architecture, really. It's not, I kind of work in the school, but I say the regulations are very strict. Yeah. Our, our whole curriculum is based on what RIBA says students have to show they know and can do. Um, so again, any question like this, I can get a very full answer from, from Sam, who heads the architecture programme, just because I don't want to say something that isn't Absolutely. No, I do understand. Yeah, no, no worries at all. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, industrial design? Some of the programs you mentioned that uh, include professional placements, um, so undergraduate degree programs. Um, so what sort of placements do students tend to get into and what sort of support is there at UCA? Uh, ne next year will actually be the first year this has happened. The course is very new. We're only in the second year of the course. Um, right. But it's the full range. I mean, we do we do not promise that we will find a placement for students, essentially. So the work placement year, it could be uh, mentoring, for example, which is very valuable. It could be kind of what we call kind of a live project, you know, so doing a project with a with a, a company. Um, a combination of those things is to do with um, kind of developing a kind of a professional profile, if that makes sense, you know, like the skills you need. I mean, basics such as a CV, but also not that, but how you present your work. Um, so within that, there's kind of a unit where the students produce a piece of work saying what they've learned through this process. You know, it, it would be wonderful if, you know, they can do a nine month placement at a company and then get some experience and then, you know, be promised a job when they graduate. That will happen for some students, other students, you know, it's not that won't be possible. So it might be smaller chunks of different different things, if that makes sense. Very, very various projects, uh, um, I guess, for students available. And uh, we had a great webinar um, last week as well on careers um, department support. So I guess there is always um, help for students at the UCA careers team, where they obviously look into CVs, help them with uh, preparing for interviews and obviously providing a list of opportunities uh, available there uh, mm -hmm. for students to submit their um, applications um, for placements. Excellent, thank you. Um, there is a question uh, which is quite specific. Um, I'm interested in sustainable architecture and have completed my uh, BA in architecture. Which line should I opt for in terms of master's degree, which does cover up the sustainable architecture or can I have a career in the same line? Uh, we are quite strongly focused actually on sustainability in architecture um we're kind of in the process of it's coming coming on stream i think in two years time of kind of not completely restructuring but but kind of having this very specifically written in to all the courses i mean all, you know already it's something that you know all all the academic staff are interested in because you know students are becoming more interested in this you know one of the examples of work i showed of margate was this idea of using seaweed to make materials 
you know so that's kind of the stuff that we encourage students to do anyway and students even if we didn't kind of have it written into briefs students when they produce their work they they frequently mention sustainability like not transporting materials from miles away not using concrete using kind of wood or bamboo or something sustainable so students are very aware of this so it, it's kind of it's covered on all the courses it's something that we do talk about all the time um so i hope that answers that bit uh, the second part of the question which line should i opt for masters which does cover the sustainable architecture and can i have a career in the same line um well for careers i would hope that most architectural practices are focusing on sustainability if yeah, it's particularly yeah. interested in you know i'm sure there are some that are better than others but as i say i can highlight saying you know it is something that is ingrained in in what we do absolutely i think sustainability is really crucial right now so it's great obviously to know that um that's something uca uh obviously involves within their programs um too um there is a question um here for students who complete their uh masters in architecture from the uk would that degree make them eligible to become an architect in india or let's say elsewhere uh, again i would assume so um i don't know i even know less about the system in india for architects but if you are qualified you know reba qualified in the uk i would i would assume it it's as good i would like to think maybe better maybe that's the thing, but, but i would like to think that it is of a of a high standard and recognized globally um but again um so that might be something that they need to investigate kind of from their their side rather than from our side but again it's a question if you send me the question you know i can see if i can find any more information about that Absolutely. Um, and obviously, with um, students now being able to apply for post-study work visas, it used to be called for graduate um, route as such, uh, meaning that they can apply for jobs uh, within the UK uh, after graduation, so their visa would be uh, valid for two years. Uh, obviously, there is a question also um, in terms of some of the companies uh, in the industry where students could potentially apply for jobs after graduation. Do we have any examples uh, of UC graduates going to work in the UK? But, and I, I do have a long <laughs> list of companies where graduates have gone, but whether that was through that scheme, I don't know. I mean, clearly, you know, there will be hundreds of architecture practices. You know, like I said, maybe students want to go into arch um, like exhibition design or museum design or experience design you know I, I would say it doesn't hurt to apply anywhere you know if you want to work for norman foster foster and associates apply you know the quality of the work that you will produce here you know with their talent you know students talent and hard work but with the support of the staff you know it does mean we've had students work for you know foster and foster and partners and zaha i did and grimshaw and all these other large architecture practices you know, I can't give a list. The list is endless of places where people could potentially apply to. You know, I could give you a list of five, and you don't want to work for, uh, at any of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's it's kind of a it's a very open ended question. I can't I can't answer. You know, if the, if the visa allows you to work, in theory, you could apply wherever you. Absolutely, yeah. That visa that visa um, is normally. Um applicable for all graduates uh, as long as they pass their degree in the UK. So it's not exactly linked to any specific company. So I would assume they can apply for any company they would like to um, yeah. in the UK. And it's great to know that UCA has all these strong industry links and can obviously um, submit their applications um, during their studies and after graduations. Uh, for a number of companies within that uh, endless list you mentioned, Paul. So um, that's great. There is a question in regards with creative computing. Can you mm -hmm. tell us a little bit more about it? Uh, I can. Like I said, it, it grew out of out of our experience having students on other courses, architecture and interiors, who were interested in learning a bit of coding because they wanted to have maybe sensors in the space that they were using that would you know, attach the motors and make parts of the building or the interior move, you know, creating different interactions with people, you know, basic ones you see in 
art galleries quite often where you where there's a dark room and you walk through the door and suddenly films come on and lights come on and music plays it's about learning how to do that basically so it's not strict computer science it's learning some coding for an outcome so you know the door in one of our studios for example counts the number of people who walk in and out that would be a very basic use of creative computing um but it's it's not just coding it's physically making things um so yeah so the example i gave a project that creative computing and my industrial designers are doing now um, it's called Embedded Systems for me and Hardware Hack for them, but it's essentially the same. And it's about creating this controllable noise-making device, not necessarily a musical instrument, because most of them aren't particularly musical, <laughs> but, you know, it's finding ab about which points on the circuit make a noise by attaching wires and soldering those two together and then deciding how do you interact with it? Do you press buttons or is it a switch or do you throw it against the wall or do you clap your hands or do you wave your hands in front of it so you're kind of controlling the noise um it's about you know working on robotics for example you know kind of controlling things with sensors all those kinds of things so it's not strict computer science this is how you build a website this is how you build a database it's about interact interaction with physical things Interesting. And, and that, I think that's something which is quite relevant right now. I mean, we all, you know, like to use uh, devices like Alexa, and it's really interesting how obviously it recognizes your voice, you can sort of give instructions, you can ask questions. And yeah, uh, yeah you don't need to press any buttons. Yeah. Um, I mean, another so, project they, they do is called, I'm sure it's called screen space, because around the universities, you know, we have walls that you can project on, we have information screens, and the students make, they they take apart, not the ones on the walls, but we have in the studio, like a projector they can take apart so they know how it works and they take apart a monitor and know how it works. And then they produce some content that goes on a screen or something. So um, one was one from last year was quite funny because it was, it was like a Google Maps thing, but it told you the wrong direction intentionally. All right. It, they, they're kind of like gorilla, like hijack these screens. So it's, it's, it's things like that. It's, you know, it's a combination of art and interaction and coding and design and lots of different things together. Excellent. And would you say that in recent years, uh, the demand for specialists in those areas uh, has increased? Uh, I mean, it, it has. I say, I say, go back to, you know, my, my reason for the course existing is because, you know, architects, interior designers, product designers, you know, they're more interested in knowing about this kind of thing. You know, there is, you know, if, if you can code for this, there are other industries that you can code in. Lighting design requires, you know, use of electronics and coding to trigger the lights, exhibition design, uh, robotics. You know, you know, there are lots of, lots of places, lots of industries where these skills are transferable to, um, yeah. you know, yeah. computers are not going to go away. Sensing technology. Absolutely not. No. Artificial intelligence is not going to go away. So the demand will definitely increase. And students applying for programs like creative um, computing, would they need to submit a portfolio as well? Uh, yeah, they do. Um, that's a, it's not a strange one. It's, it's an unusual one because we do get a lot of, you know, like people have come from the UK system, you know, they might do A level computer science, mm -hmm. but they've also done art. Or you might have someone who's done physics, chemistry, and music, but they, in their spare time, they make websites. So we kind of, so again, yeah, it's a portfolio, but not just showing that you can build a database. Yes, we want to see that, great, because it means you have skills that you can use, but we want to see that it's about well, the way people think. Can people be creative? You know, in a lot of senses, the, the hard skills, you can teach somebody to code but teaching somebody kind of the more creative things, it's not impossible, it's more, it's more difficult. You know, if somebody has, someone is a brilliant coder, but it's just about databases, fantastic. It's not necessarily, doesn't necessarily, they don't necessarily have the brain to use that creatively to again, have some like map system that tells you intentionally the wrong way. It's a different way of thinking. Um, so yeah, so it's a portfolio, but showing what you can do. Can you draw? Can you code? Do you make guitars in your spare time? You know, <laughs> making is kind of what we like to see. 
And I guess for international students also applying for undergraduate degrees, in case if there is a worry about portfolio, if there is a lack of portfolio, shall we say, there is international foundation program in place at UCA, which helps students to prepare for their bachelor's degree. Or if they haven't met one of the requirements like English, for example, IELTS, so that will also help them to, I guess, uh, improve their English skills, mm -hmm. as well as to decide as to which bachelor's degree to progress to um, after the foundation. Um, what I really liked, you mentioned, um, in terms of the uh, number of students per class um, is, is, is not high, meaning there is a lot of support available for students mm -hmm. and lots of one-to-one -one tuition as well. Um, so I guess it also depends on the program. So for instance, for industrial design, what sort of number of students per per class are there at UCA? Uh, look, this is a strange one because of what happened in like in the last year. So the, the first year there were five or six because it's the first year of the course. Then we had, I think there were 12 registered, but then a lot couldn't enroll. So it's kind of growing. So the kind of numbers are small, but increasing quite quickly. So next year we're looking at, I'm not sure yet, 15, 16. That's kind of particularly small, but kind of growing rapidly. Creative computing is a little bit smaller, but kind of but the same. Um, I mean, the bigger courses are architecture, and interiors, they're kind of like the two big courses. Um, but again, it very comes kind of, so kind of 80 to 100 in the first year. Um, right, okay. Um, but I would imagine there are still sort of some group exercises where students are split into smaller groups. And like you mentioned, there is still one-to-one -one support available to students um, on, on, on a weekly basis. Well, it's, it's minimum week. I mean, there are weekly tutorials, but you know, we have, we have kind of sessional tutors who will take like a tutor group for some of the projects. So the, so the 100 will be split into kind of six groups and they will see their tutor. So kind of like one day they will be in and it'll be kind of tutorials and that kind of thing. But there is always, there is always time for one-to-one -one contact with tutors because it's important, you know, students, I mean, we like it because we like to know what our students are doing, but the students like it because, you know, like I say, you know, they, they, they don't need, they don't always need strict guidance, but they like to know that what how they are thinking is is kind of along the right lines or yeah, you know, yeah, absolutely. Wrong, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. And it's definitely great to stay in touch, I guess, with your tutor on a regular basis and just mm -hmm. obviously for the tutor also to see how students are progressing and where they are with their projects. And in terms of the assessments, um are there any exams at all um, for those programs, or is it mainly um, sort of portfolio work again, projects? Again, architecture is slightly different because there are exams that architects have to pass. But I suppose on, on a more a general, more continuous basis, um, usually if it's there, will be points in a project where there is kind of formative feedback. So it'll be. Sometimes it's once a week, pin your work up on the wall, talk about it for five minutes, get some feedback. Um, then there's usually a point halfway through where it's it's a bit more formalized. So there'll be some, kind of some written feedback. This is what I do for my students. And then the hand-ins are usually like, they, it's a portfolio hand-in. So it's a body of work. It's a model, it's photographs, it's films, it's your sketches, it's all of these. And those are marked um, properly, like written feedback is given and you were given your mark. And kind of that's how we, that's how we do it. Excellent. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, apologies, we've run out of time. If you do have any further questions, feel free to reach out to us uh, to UCA Partners at Gas.Global or your relevant business developer. If you're an educational agency or UCA Questions at Gas.Global, if you're a student applying directly. And uh, thank you once again, Paul, for a great webinar. Really useful. I've learned a lot myself, to be honest. Um, <laughs> and we hope to welcome um, students studying the subjects obviously we discussed today at UCA this September. Um, yep. Have a great day everyone. Thank you once again for attending. Bye-bye. Thank you everyone. Bye. Thank you.